Today is Wednesday, December 18th, 2013. This is the start of an interview with Arthur Perkins at Old City Hall. We're at 115 Maddie Street, Denham Springs, Louisiana. My name is Sarah Colombo and I will be the interviewer. I'm the head of adult services for the Livingston Parish Library. And we're going to talk to Mr. Perkins about his knowledge of African Americans and the education system in the parish and also about his personal family history. Um, so just go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Arthur Perkins Sr. Um, I was born and raised in Denton Springs, Louisiana. Um, I was um, born, according to my mother, on what is called the Rainy Place. And the Rainy Place is um, on uh, Peach Highway. Why is it called the Rainy Place? It was uh, owned by the uh, Rainies. Okay. Uh -huh. And what, um, when were you born? Say again. When were you born? I was born February 24th of 1935. Um, I don't remember living on the rainy place. What I do remember was living on um, the Hutchison place, which is on Centerville Street. Um, we lived there. My uh, father was raised in the house um, along with a son that they had named uh, Cooper Hutchison. And um, my father worked for the uh, sawmill, which was uh, next door to the uh, Hutchison place. And where did you, did you grow up on the Hutchison place or did you move other places? I uh, grew up, um, well I was fairly young when I, we left the uh, Hutchison place, but um, I remember being there and I remember walking from um, there to the grocery store which was on Range Avenue, uh, the Allen Sisters. And I remember walking to um, Roberts United Methodist Church, which was on um, River Road, right um, east of the um, Denham Spring Cemetery. But what I do remember by walking those roads at the time, we would uh, oft times be ducked at by um, young white boys who were driving cars. And there weren't that many cars, so um, when we got back home, we would tell Mr. Howard Hutchison what had happened. And uh, we would describe the car, whether it was a black car, white car, and we would describe the uh, driver. And um, that car and driver never ducked at us again once we uh, reported it to uh, Mr. Hutchison. What does that mean, ducked at you? Like swerved tried to towards hit you? you? Tried yeah. to hit you and we had to jump in the ditch to keep from being hit. Um, so your parents, where were your parents born? My mother was born in uh, Deerfall, Louisiana, which is um, uh, in the Zachary area. It, it may not be called Deer Four now, but that's what they called it at the time when she was there. And they moved here. Um, I'm not sure where my father, my, well my father was born and raised here also because the uh, Hutchison's raised him. What was your father's name? My father's name was Joe Ivy Perkins. And your mother? Elmer uh, Jackson Perkins Scott. And um, what were their, do you know their birthdays? Their birthdays, my mother's birthday was uh, July 4th, uh, 1915. Hers is easy to remember mm -hmm. because of the, the July 4th holiday. Um, my father was born um, July 26th. My father was born February, I'm sorry, December 22nd, 1914. Okay. And, and he was born in uh, uh, Livingston Parish. In the Denham, in, on that same property? I'm, a, I'm not sure about that site, but, but, but the records show that it was in Livingston Parish. <laughs> and did you have any siblings? I have two sisters, um, 
Oena McCray is in Saginaw, Michigan, and Helen Washington is in Los Angeles, California, and they both came here and we had Thanksgiving t together. Oh, nice. Um, we um, used to rotate to each other's house for Christmas. Um, we would go to Saginaw one Christmas and the next Christmas we'd go to Los Angeles and the next Christmas we would be here at uh, my house. Um, when we would go to Saginaw, it was um, naturally December and the snow and ice was everywhere and we would drive and we were lucky if we got in and we were lucky if we got out. Um, we decided that we weren't going to do go there for Christmas anymore, that we would go there on the 4th of July and we would have Christmas on the 4th of July in, in Saginaw. We would uh, light the Christmas tree and we would sing Christmas carols, we would exchange gifts, we would do everything that we would do at Christmas time. And uh, I guess the neighbors thought that we had lost it, but we did have the news media to come out and to uh, take pictures and run articles in the newspaper. Oh, nice. <laughs> Um, what what are your sister's birthdays? Uh, my uh, <clears throat> Oena was born. <clears throat> Oena was born April twenty fifth, nineteen thirty two, and Helen was born January twentieth, nineteen thirty four, <clears throat> and I was born uh, as I had said earlier, um, February twenty fourth, nineteen thirty five. And are there their maiden names are Perkins too? Their maiden names were Perkins. Um, Helen married uh, John Washington, and Oena married Marvin McCray. Uh, John is was from um, Alabama, and Marvin was from uh, uh, up sixteen, closer to uh, Greensburg. Do you know how your family ended up? moving to Denham Springs, your parents? I'm not sure why they, they moved from um, Deerfall to uh, Denham Springs. I'm, I'm just not sure. They met in Deerfall and then moved here together? Or did they meet here? Um, they moved here and then my father met my, uh, my mother here. Your mother's family moved here and then? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about your school history in the parish first as a student? Um, I attended uh, what was formerly called West Livingston High School. Um, I uh, began my uh, education at age five. My, um, the principal which was Mrs. Lockhart, told my mother that since my two sisters were in school that she may as well send me as well. And she sent me and I was a little bit young so I cried a lot. Um, I, I don't know why I cried. My sisters were there but it was just different and it took me a while to adjust. Um, but anyway, I attended that school and uh, that school was located on uh, Florida Boulevard, right where McDonald's is uh, now on Florida. Um, that school remained there until um, the late 40s or the early 50s when it was moved to uh, Rodeo Drive. Rodeo Drive is now called Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, um, drive. Um, that property, it is now used as a recreation center, but that property was bought by um, the uh, people in the neighborhood and um, it was donated to the school board with the stipulation that it would um, be used to educate the black uh, children 
and when it ceased to educate black children, then it would uh, revert back to those who donated it. That's, and that school was, as I remember it, was a, um, the building was a Rosenwald building, and it had um, three rooms. Uh, two rooms were connected, and there was a petition. You can open it up if you had plays, if you had uh, movies or something that you wanted to show, then it would be a large room. The other room was sometimes used as a uh, kitchen bef before we um, start using it as a classroom. And that was just for elementary school or is that all that, grades? That was elementary and um, we, um, the school started taking on um, high school um, kids. Before it started taking on high school kids, our students who finished uh, seventh or eighth grade would go to uh, either McKinley in Baton Rouge or Capital in Baton Rouge to finish their education. Sometimes the students would stay with relatives and then come home on weekends and sometimes they would commute um, daily either by a um, Greyhound bus or by someone else who was old enough to drive and, and took them to, to school. But the first graduating class was in 1953 and just prior to that class each year we would add on a grade in the high school until we finally reached uh, uh, 12th grade. Okay. And um, the first class was 1953 and I was in the second class which was 1954. My sister Oena who had dropped out of school and came back to finish, uh, finished in the first class, and I was in the uh, second class. And at that point, it was at the property where the Ellen Lockhart Center is. That's now? that's the the site of the um, the the uh, school, and uh, it's remained there until um, integration. And in 1969, the high school. Uh, left because it was integrated into um, other schools and um, uh, in 1970 the elementary left and um, then the school was closed. At that time um, I was um, demoted to uh, uh, a teacher. I had taught mathematics uh, at that school I uh, started teaching in 1958 and um, I be, uh, became assistant principal and taught math and uh, the principal retired and I became the principal two years before the school uh, closed. So I was demoted and I had been asked by a, uh, another principal would I teach math at uh, his school. Uh, his was an elementary school and my answer was yes I will teach math at your school I have a family to feed however I really feel like the school board should um, give me a job as principal and um, so I was set to to teach and that summer just before school opened we have held um, court and um, the um, I remember the judge was Judge West. It was a uh, district court. It was held in Baton Rouge. And um, I remember the um, judge, the lawyer for uh, us, and I say us because all of the black principals that were uh, three more, and, um, and the teachers as well, were formed into that lawsuit because some teachers were not placed as well. And um, our lawyer would say um, the Simpson case sets the precedent for um, this lawsuit. And uh, they asked um, the attorney for the school board, did he know about Simpson? And he said he did not know about Simpson. 
So um, Judge West ruled that if you're good enough to teach in a black school, then you're good enough to teach in any school, then you're good enough to be a principal in any school if you're a principal in a black school. Therefore, uh, you have to give them their jobs back. So at the very last minute, the superintendent called me and asked me where did I want to go. And I told him it did not matter. I would um, do my job no matter where I went. Um, so I was assigned to uh, Albany High School. Um, Melvin Brown was assigned to Springfield High School. And Leroy Travis was assigned to um, um, Denham Springs Junior High. They uh, kept the former principals on and called them supervising principals. Um, that went for a year, but it did not work very well because um, I, I can only answer for what happened in Albany. Um, parents were accustomed to going to that principal if they had a problem. So if a child got in trouble and got suspended, instead of them coming to me, they would go to him. And uh, he would rule, not rule, but he would tell them that uh, the child needs to be in school and uh, in other words it would give fuel to the fire and uh, make it a little bit more difficult to to maintain the the posture that I had um, then it would go to the central office and and of course the central office would call and I would explain what happened and uh, it was always upheld the decision that I had made However, it made it difficult to operate with, with, with two factions on the same campus. So after one year, they removed the uh, supervising principals from the school site and put them at the central office and gave them other duties uh, to do there. Um, but that's the way that worked for a while. Um, I would attend everything that happened at the school. Um, if that was a basketball game, I would be in attendance. If that was a football game, I would be in attendance. If uh, no matter what happened, I would be there. And I devoted so much time to it until I neglected my duties as a reserve officer um, in the. Uh, Army Reserve and after a period of time they discharged me um, from uh, the Reserve Corps uh, because I had put my mandatory time in. Um, I had to put in eight years and I had put in uh, ten years so um, I was discharged. When things level out at school I decided that putting 10 years in with is half of what it takes to retire, that I need to go back and put in 10 more. So I contacted uh, the reserves and um, all of the officer slots were taken. So they say, we will take you as a uh, enlisted person. And the highest enlisted person uh, rank they offered me was uh, E6, which, which was sergeant. And the thing about the military is, no matter what rank you serve, when you retire, you retire at the highest rank that you held. So um, at the time, I had been promoted to major before I was uh, discharged. And um, I accepted the E6 slot and I went back in and I operated as a sergeant. Uh, in the meantime, I was in touch with the uh, National Guard, Louisiana Army National Guard, and um, 
I explained that I was, um, I explained my situation in a letter. And I got a letter back from the adjutant general said that we will accept you as a uh, major uh, and we will assign you to uh, um, uh, the 204 area support group at Jackson Barracks. So um, I accepted that assignment and I reported there. Um, but I remember uh, being there and I spent five years there uh, and this was weekend duty. But all of the uh, enlisted people there, there were any number of blacks that were uh, assigned to the 204 area support group. They uh, looked at me as if I was a, uh, a plant, that I was sent there to spy on someone to see what they were doing, whether or not they were using drugs or whatever they were doing that may be illegal. They did not think that I was uh, assigned as everybody else was assigned to do a particular job. But um, before I left there, they realized that, you know, I was there to do a job and was not there to spy on anyone. But um, I really enjoyed the duties with the uh, National Guard because it gave me a chance to um, travel and to meet other people and to see other sites. Uh, the Probably the most important site was um, when I was sent to train, the, we sent the whole unit to train with the um, Seattle uh, unit, uh, which was a um, area support group as well. They had gone on what is called a reforger. A reforger is where a unit from here will go overseas and receive the units that are coming from here, landing there, take care of them, supply all of their needs, and then send them on into Germany or send them wherever they needed to go. Well, we trained there for three or four years during the summer. Um, I remember going in August because school had just opened and I would have to leave school for a couple of weeks and go there and train. That went well as far as the school is concerned. Um, they, they operated and we were all set to go. All the teachers were in their slots and um, the, the assistant principal would take over when I would leave. I remember um, Seattle in August was very, very cold to me. Uh, it, there was a little mist of rain every day. It, it didn't rain hard. It wasn't hard enough for me to put on a raincoat or anything, but there was that mist every day and they call it rain. But I remember us buying all of the um, long handle underwear and all of the uh, sweatshirts that we could find. And I don't remember getting warm until I came back here. And of course here, it must have been in the 90s in, in August. But um, we would train and then finally we got the call to go to um, Holland, um, which was an experience for me. Um, we went there and we actually performed the duties uh, of a regular uh, army unit to, um, to receive the units, give them whatever they needed in terms of housing, in terms of showers, in terms of food, and whatever they needed, we took care of it and then we sent them on in to uh, Germany or wherever they, they needed to go. We worked long hours there. Uh, I was a logistics officer. I was in charge of logistics. And uh, we worked 12 hours. And then we would be off 12. Well, I would work 12 hours. And if I knew a unit was coming in, even though I was off, I would go and take a nap and I would come back to make sure that the job was being taken care of because uh, if something failed to happen, as it's, if something does not happen as it's supposed to happen, then 
you're going to be criticized and um, not only the person who was there on duty but the person his superior may be criticized as well and I didn't want anything negative in my uh, folder so I would go back and I would make sure that everything was taken care of. There were some who got a chance to um, go into Paris because you could travel from where we were. You could get an Amtrak train and you could go into Paris on a 24-hour pass, see the sights in Paris and then come back within that 24 hours and be ready for duty the, the next day. But um, I was never able to, to do that. I remember asking my superior for a pass and I said, what is my chances? He said, slim and none. So that meant forget it. So I, I, even though I was that close, I did not get a chance to, uh, to go into uh, Paris. But um, in, in working at Albany High School, we had a vacancy in the um, English department. And I remember hiring a uh, teacher. I was from New York. Uh, which was a strange thing because I wasn't used to interviewing and hiring somebody from out of state. But anyway, um, I interviewed her mostly by telephone and then finally in person. And um, she said that she would take the job. And I found out later that her husband was uh, taking courses at LSU and they wanted to be closer. So therefore, um, she was looking for a job uh, closer to um, LSU. And that's the reason they moved from New York here, not to take a job at Albany High School, but because of him in school. Well, anyway, in hiring her, I found out that um, she had taught in um, France. So she had connections in France. And we formed a, uh, a, a group where uh, we would invite students from France here uh, one year and then the next year we would go to France and the unique thing about it was that we would stay in the homes of the uh, French people they would stay in the homes of uh, the Louisiana people and this way you get a chance to see what the culture is like rather than if you if you stay in a hotel there are things that you're going to miss like uh, what is it like uh, at breakfast? What is it like uh, at, at, for the evening meal? Uh, or what, what, what's taking place? Well, it was strange, but I found that um, they served uh, one thing at a time. For example, if you, if you had an evening meal, they may bring out something like a salad um, and and with some bread. There was always wine on the table, always. Um, I really didn't, at the first meal, I really didn't know whether or not there was anything else to come. So what I tried to do was fill up on the bread and the, the uh, salad. I found out after we finished the salad, they would move the, 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 the salad bowl. Then they would bring, say, the chicken or the turkey or the steak or whatever, and they would put that on the table, and then you would eat that, and then they may bring some peas, or they may bring something else, and then last they may bring uh, um, a dessert. But it was one thing at a time, not everything on the table at one time. Uh, I thought that was, that was a little bit strange but what really interested me was that there was nothing else taking place except that was family time. It was a time for them to discuss if some of the children were having a problem, they would talk about it at the table. There was nobody reading a newspaper, nobody reading a magazine, nobody, the TV was off. I mean, it was strictly family time. And um, I, I, I thought that that was, was unique because sometimes 
at my house, I may be sitting one place, my wife may be somewhere else, and the kids may be eating somewhere else. And it is not that all of us are dining together, but um, that's the way that they, they, uh, they did it. Uh, and then that gave me a chance to get into uh, Paris because by going there, we landed in Paris. And um, not only did we live in the homes, I lived in the home of the, uh, the uh, principal. Uh, and um, he was married to the assistant principal. And they had over there, the principal and the assistant principal are given houses to live in. So we lived in one of the houses, and, um, and the house was close to the campus. So um, we got a chance to um, go into the schools and see how they operated, uh, pretty much like us, except I noticed the kids, when they took a break, they would go on the hall and they uh, would smoke. And so I asked the principal, I said, you, you're allowing them to smoke on campus? He said, were they smoking in the classroom? I said, no. In other words, if they weren't smoking in the classroom, then there's no problem. And I said, okay. Then, uh, but that, that, that was odd because here we don't allow smoking on the campus at all. And, and but there it's accepted. Um, but I, I, I um, it was a learning situation, and I don't know if they still are doing that. I doubt it because that teacher has moved on, and is no longer at the school. You're still in touch with them? For a while, I was, um, but uh, then I lost my. Uh, I have not been in touch for a while. I want to talk a little bit about your time with the National Guard. What year did you enlist? Um, with the National Guard, um, the schools integrated in, um, 70, um, I went back to the reserves. It had to be, um, early, um, maybe the late seventies when I went, I spent five years, um, at, um, uh, in New Orleans. And then I was sent to um, Camp Burgard and spent five years there. Um, that was when you re-enlisted? That's when I re when I re-enlisted. When I re-enlisted, um, I was um, assigned to a unit in Baton Rouge in reserves. What about when you originally enlisted? Um, uh, um, the first ten years? The, the first um, ten years. What happened was I um, was in ROTC at Southern University, and in graduating, I graduated with a uh, with the, the rank of second lieutenant, and I was um, that was in um, uh, I finished high school in 1954, and I finished college in three years. Uh, I finished in 1957 and got my commission in 1957 as a second lieutenant. I started teaching at West Livingston. And um, then I got the assignment that I needed to report to um, Fort Lee, Virginia, and, and, and go through officer training. They have a school that even though you, you're an officer, then you have to go to a particular school if you're quartermaster or if you're infantry, uh, or whatever you, your, your uh, specialty is. You have to go to a school and you have to uh, finish that school. If you fail to finish it, if you flunk out, then you are sent back home and then you, you're subject to be uh, enlisted uh, as, as a uh, private. So um, I was assigned to, to uh, Fort Lee, Virginia, and that was uh, in the, in, in, um, like in November of 1958, um, uh, or 57, 1957, and um, I had to do six months 
I finished the school and did the six months and then I was sent back. Then after you come back, you have to do eight years in the reserves. So I came back and started teaching and then I joined a unit, uh, joined the 951st Quartermaster Outfit in, in Baton Rouge, which was a segregated outfit. And um, my uh, duties were a training officer to make sure that all of the training was being taken care of and the instructors for the classes were assigned and that they had to be there to, to teach. And if they were not there, then you, you were responsible. Either you taught the class or you got somebody else to, to, to teach the class. So, uh, after being there for a while, um, the, um, the unit uh, integrated and we had an all black unit and an all white unit and they put the two together and they called it like uh, the 353rd. They didn't call it the, the 951st or whatever unit they were. The new unit was a, had a new uh, a number assigned to it. So th that, that worked it fine and um, so finally I was pretty much promoted out of there because the highest rank there, the, um, the company commander was a captain. So when you get promoted beyond that, then you need to look for uh, another slot, uh, another assignment somewhere. But just about that time is when we integrated the schools and then uh, I was discharged. Um, so I had put in 10 years and um, I had the rank of major and so that's when I uh, separated from um, so I went in there in 1958 so this was like uh, 68 when I when I left there. In 1958 is when you began teaching at West Livingston? I began teaching in 1957 I graduated right. in the summer of um, 1957 and that summer I got a job at um, uh, uh, West Livingston to, to teach math. And what year did you become vice principal or assistant principal? I had taught about uh, five years and then um, I became uh, uh, assistant principal along with my teaching duties. So Who was the principal? The principal was Mrs. Ellen Louise Matt Lockhart. Uh, who is the um, one of the buildings is named after her now at the Ellen, they call it the Ellen Lockhart Center. She uh, was the principal when you were in school too, right? She was the principal when I was in school and um, she was also my uh, Sunday school teacher and she, she belonged to Roberts United Methodist Church and I did also and she was also the superintendent of the Sunday school. But she ran a very, very stern hand. Um, everybody that went to school there was subject to the same thing. And not only did she uh, discipline you for what you did or failed to do at school, but in the community, if you did something that was not right in her eyesight, that you were going to be punished for it. If you were caught with a cigarette in your hand, if you were caught with a beer, if you were caught doing something that you had no business, then you, you had to answer. And if um, you went to a school function, you had to go home when you left that function. If you failed to go to your house, then you could be punished for going elsewhere. So if you wanted to walk a girl home, then your best bet would be to go and step on your steps and then <laughs> go and walk the girl home. Otherwise, then once you hit your steps, then you're no longer under the school the rules. You're under your parent rules. So then you would be free to do whatever you wanted to do, as long as it was not anything that was uh, considered outrageous like um, smoking or drinking or something of that nature. Um, but everything revolved around the school, the school, the home, 
and the church were, they all worked together. Um, when I say work together, um, the school would not assign a ball game, a play a ball game on a Wednesday night if that was a night for Bible study or if there was something going on at the school. We, 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 we respected each, each other that way. Um, the, the churches would not do anything contrary to what the school was doing. And the parent respected both the schools and the, and the, um, the schools and the church. So the three worked pretty close together and it was difficult for students to do anything that was not right when those three were working together because all the people in the community could correct you as well as uh, the teachers and, and the uh, church people. Were you involved in any extracurricular activities when you were in school? I played basketball the entire um, time. We, uh, the high school, um, we did not have a gymnasium. The gymnasium was built the year after I left, so we had a dirt court. Uh, we put the basketball goals up and um, we had to learn the game. Now, the, uh, the uh, principal's stepson was named William Lockhart. He was principal of Chainerville High School. Chainerville was known for outstanding uh, athletes and uh, played basketball well, boys and girls. So uh, Mr. Lockhart would come out in the evening sometime and teach us how to play the game, how to dribble, how to shoot, and that kind of thing. So um, uh, it, it was a plus that, um, that that relationship existed between Mrs. Lockhart and her son because he would help us and uh, then I guess in some manner maybe she would help them. But, but that was a good relationship there. And then we would play games. Once we would start playing, we would play against each other. And um, what was the school like? The especially, I'm interested in the Rosenwald school. You said it was three rooms. What it, about the heat and the condition of the school? Um, the the we had a uh, a, a wood heater, and um, uh, there was no such thing as air, and we had no fans, but we would raise the windows for air to, to come in. Um, we would, um, although there were only three rooms, there would be more than one grade in a room. For example, uh, whoever was teaching uh, first grade may have had the first, second, and third grade in that room, and then another room may have had uh, three more grades, and then another room may have had two or three grades. Um, the only advantage that I can think of was that if I was in um, fourth grade and there was a fifth and sixth grade class in there and if they were having social studies, if you listen, you could probably learn from them. Uh, uh, not that you, you were going to retain it, but at least you, you, you would have heard it before. And uh, then when it's your time, then um, it may not be as difficult if you paid attention to, to catch it um, when it was your time to uh, be taught. What about materials? What kind of materials did you have? Um, we had uh, textbooks. Uh, we, we um, textbooks and, 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 and writing paper and pencil is about what we had. Now, our textbooks were hand-me-down textbooks from, um, from the white uh, school. If the books had gotten a little bit used and, 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 and a little bit raggedy, then uh, some of the pages were torn out, then they would get new books and we would get what they had. And the same thing with the uh, desks. Sometimes the desks that we got would have carved names and initials and that kind of thing. And um, so that's, that's what we got. We got the supplies that were perhaps not wanted at the other schools. 
And so you said you graduated in 1954? 1954. And you went to a Southern University? I went to Southern University. Were you the first person in your family to go to college or did other people? No, my uh, older sister uh, went and then she, well, not my middle sister was the first because the older sister had dropped out and, and was late finishing high school. So um, my uh, uh, middle sister was the first in our family to go. And um, I remember um, I would help her with her math. Even when I was in high school, I would help her with her math, her college math. Um, but she finished and she became an elementary teacher. Um, my uh, older sister um, finished high school ahead of me and then she went to, even though she was married, then she went to college and her husband was in uh, Michigan and uh, she would uh, be here and when she finished and she went to Michigan and she became a uh, teacher and then she became a uh, supervisor and when she retired then she ran for school board member and she became a school board member. Um, but she's completely retired now. What were your parents' occupations? My um, father uh, worked at the sawmill. He worked at the McCarroll sawmill, which was next door to the Hutchison property. And that's where the junior high school is now on uh, Hatcher Lane. That, that was a sawmill site. Um, my um, father worked there and drove truck there. Um, later, he, um, the person that he was raised with, Mr. Cooper Hutchison, was employed at, um, at uh, what we call the Standard Oil. It was uh, Exxon, and that's what Exxon was called, the Standard Oil. So Mr. Cooper was employed there, and he got Daddy a job there. So Daddy worked at Exxon. I'm not sure what his job was there, but at the time, that was the best job that anybody who um, did not have a, um, uh, a trade uh, could, could get it salary wise. It's probably better than some of those who did have um, a trade. It's just like today, Exxon is one of the, the, the higher paid uh, employers in, in the area. My mother worked um, domestic work. She, she worked um, for um, Mr. Joe Jackson and his wife was named Helen Jackson. Um, they um, had that building there and they had a hardware store and uh, he was into uh, the hardware business and she was into antiques. Um, but anyway, my mother worked at their house and cooked and cleaned for them. That was what she did and, and, and they, my mother and father separated and divorced uh, before I left the uh, Hutchison place. Um, um, and my mother raised us. Did she remarry? She remarried after we had finished school. She remarried. She married uh, uh, Bernard uh, Scott, who, who uh, died before she did. Um, and are both your parents are deceased? Both are deceased. What? When did they die? My uh, father uh, died. Uh, July 26, 1984, and my mother died um, July 9, 1996. She was born July 4th, and she died July 9th, um, shortly after her uh, birthday in, in 96. So she was 82? 82, 83. Um, where are they buried? They are buried in Plainview Cemetery, which is where uh, we, uh, Plainview is uh, north of Denham Springs. If you're going to um, up at 
to McDonald's on 16, take a left, and you go around, you know where the Fleurs is, or do you? Mm -hmm. Okay, just before you get there on the right hand side is, uh, should be Plainview Road, and, and there's a cemetery, three or four acres that um, the church owns, and that's where the cemetery is. And, and what church? Still, hmm? What church? Roberts United Methodist Church owns it, but it's pretty much a cemetery for the blacks in Denham Springs. Um, at one time, Roberts was the only church, and it, it bought that property. Then other churches splintered off from there, the Baptist churches and the Holy churches. So Roberts still uh, maintained the title and, and, and um, in charge of the, the cemetery. So, um, since you and your sisters all went to college, I'm assuming you were pretty heavily encouraged by your mother to go to the university? Uh, heavily encouraged and um, also by some of the teachers um, at the school would, would, would encourage you to go to college and um, uh, especially if you were good in a particular subject. And like I was in math and my sister was in English and um, and my wife was in English. Um, were there particular people in the community who were kind of held up to you as examples? Who had been, had gone to college or? The biggest example I had was William Lockhart at Chaneville. I always looked at him because most of the people that I saw locally were, um, were, were, were females. And here's, here was a male who was a principal of a school and doing an outstanding job. So I, I kind of used him um, as someone that I probably wanted to be like. And so what year did you become the principal at Albany? In Albany, I became principal in 1970. And that was the first year the schools were integrated? That, that was the first year the, um, the elementary, because the high school had gone the year before. And, and I was left with, with the elementary at West Livingston. I had one through eighth grade. And before we, we integrated, I had one through 12. So nine through 12 was taken in 69. And then the rest of the school was taken in 1970. And either I had to go and teach math out of school, or either I was going to have my job back as principal. Well, just before school opened in 1970, the judge gave his ruling and um, the headlines in the Morning Advocate was, Judge West spanks the Livingston Parish School Board. <laughs> so when I would go to the central office, I would walk in and they say, well, the school board got spanked today. Huh? I say, well, yes, they did. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we were assigned. And, and the assignment, the, the, the court was held just prior to the opening of school. So I never had a chance to meet any of my faculty at Albany until the first day of school, which was the, t the children didn't come, but the faculty was, came. And I remember calling the roll in, in faculty meeting, and I didn't know whether it was a miss, a missus, a mister. I would call a name, and, and the names were um, not names I was familiar with because that's heavily Hungarian area mm -hmm. and and some of the names I couldn't even pronounce them so uh, that, that that was an experience right there you know you call a name and then hear somebody raise their hand and so that's 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 normally I have I have I meet with the teachers one-on-one -on -one, you know even to to hire them or to um, talk about what their needs might be and that kind of thing, you know, during the, the summer. I didn't have that opportunity. I, all at once that was, a, here's, here's the, the staff, here's your faculty, and you got to meet them and then uh, make the assignments and that kind of thing. It, 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 it worked, but it was strange. <laughs> and what year did you retire? I retired in uh, 98. I remember... Um, that I, I taught, I mean, I was there 28 years. And when I walked on campus the first day, 
there was some who said, and one was a bus driver, I give him three weeks before they run him off. And that, that three weeks turned into 28 years. <laughs> Did you experience a lot of resistance or tension or anything? There was resistance. There was uh, people who just didn't want to accept it. Um, some of the students were rebellious. Um, of course, they didn't stay long if you know if they did not follow the rules, uh, and the rules were um, evenly enforced across the, 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 the student body. But some of it had to do with um, uh, long hair, um, uh, the dress code was enforced. Um, and that was a um, that was a problem, but because um, oh, it was the '70s. Yeah, people had that's right. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that um, we would paddle the boys, but we and, and and corporal punishment was outlawed. But if somebody agreed to it and a parent agreed to it, then it was acceptable. Instead of being sent home, you could you could um, you could use the paddle. So uh, we we were paddling the boys, and here come a um, a white girl into my office and say you're prejudiced, and I say I don't think so. She say yeah you're prejudiced. Say you paddle the boys, but you won't paddle the girls. I say okay, let's let's work on that. So in talking to the faculty we decided that we would offer the girls a, a choice. They could be paddled or they could go home. And uh, we had some female teachers who said, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do it, I'll help you with that. And then the assistant principal at the time was a, um, a female. So we agreed that we would offer the girls a chance to either take the paddling from a female uh, either go home and um, but the rule was that you had to have a certified person like another teacher to witness so you, it wouldn't be just one person it would be a paddler which would be a teacher and it would be a, uh, a another teacher to witness just in case uh, somebody said you did something that you didn't do so, and that worked it well. Now, whether or not it's still going on, I don't know. But uh, I, I had to prove that, <laughs> that I wasn't prejudiced. <laughs> and, and I think the same one who came in and challenged me was probably the first one to get the book. <laughs> okay. um. I would like to tell you about my um, other experiences as a as a worker. Yeah. I um, my first job, well, well, outside of what we did as a family. Now we we uh, during the summer we would pick beans and we would pick strawberries as a family, and um, then whatever money was gotten, my mother took it and that was to buy grocery and buy clothes or whatever. Um, but I got a job at Benton Brothers. Benton Brothers is next door to us now. I was about seven and eight, eight grade, and my job was to come up early in the morning and sweep the store. I would come and sweep the store, and then I would go to school. Uh, then on uh, evenings, I would come up and I'd help deliver furniture. Um, and um, during the summer, I would work uh, the entire summer and, and uh, that was a um, um, thing that really helped me and the family a lot because whatever money I made I gave it to my mother and that helped to take care of the, the house. Um, then I um, later worked at 
what is called an ore factory, O O A R, where they made boat oars. Uh, they had a um, the first site, and I didn't work it here. Was across the street, and they had a big pond where they had the log thing. Then they moved it down on uh, Florida Boulevard, just as you leave out of Denham Springs. It was on the right hand side. Um, anyway, um, I learned how to drive a truck. I wasn't driving at all, but when when I, I would watch the older people as we delivered furniture, how they would shift and how they would hold the, the stay in the road. So one day they asked me to go and take something somewhere and I went by my house and blew the horn and my mother came to the door and she almost fainted. When, <laughs> when there was nobody in the truck except me, she didn't know that I was driving. But anyway. Did you have a license? Or you no, didn't have to no, have one? <laughs> no. <laughs> they, um, I never had a problem because I didn't speed or anything. Mm -hmm. And then later on I, I got a license, but um, after I learned how to drive and I was driving, then um, we, we um, consolidated the schools. We, didn't, we had a black school in Walker, we had one up 16, we had one around Marpaws, and we had them scattered. And then we consolidated and made two schools. We made a West Livingston and an East Livingston. The East Livingston was out around Albany, between Albany and Springfield. Well, when we did that, then we had to put on buses. And, and we, we um, um, Ms. Lockhart's husband was elderly and, and he bought a bus and he tried to drive it, but he didn't do very well. So I was about 11th grade and he, he hired me to drive the school bus. And my route was to go all the way to Livingston and pick up and then come back through Walker and Carbon and pick up and then drop the kids here. Well, that went well because the first stop in Livingston, that was a teacher there named Miss uh, Bridgman. And she rode the bus, and she, uh, all of them were stern disciplinarians. So she rode the bus, and I never had a problem because she would get on it from the first stop, and she would be the last one to get off. So they were under supervision the whole time. Um, and this is where I met my uh, wife. She, she's from Walker, and she was one of the kids who got on the bus. And uh, some mornings, her mother had a uh, big, a nice rose bush, and she would cut a rose. And when she got on the bus, she'd give me a rose oh. and say, good morning. And uh, um, so now I see where, and I say to her that she was planting seeds, and they finally uh, produced a, a um, matrimony between the, 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 the two of us anyway. We have been married uh, 55 years, I believe. What's uh, your wife's name? Nora. Nora. Maiden name is Johnson, and she's from Walker, and she still goes to church at her church where she uh, grew up in, in Walker, and, which is a Baptist church. And I go to Methodist, and all of the kids went with me to church and Sunday school until they got to be adults, and then they were could go wherever they wanted to. but. That's how we raised the uh, family. Um, what year were you married? I was married in 1958. Uh, got went in the military in 57. Got out in 58, and shortly thereafter, we married. And that was after you'd graduated from college. After I graduated from college and had done my little brief time in on Good active morning. duty. Good morning. Let me um, pause this for a minute. Mm -hmm. How many children do you have? We have uh, four. We have three boys and a uh, girl. What are their um, names and birthdays? Uh, the oldest is Arthur Jr. And he was born um, April 9th, 
1960. And then there's Michael. Michael was born April 2nd, 1961. And then there's Jeffrey. There's Jeffrey, who was born January 11, 1963. And there's Tanya, the only girl, born October 26, 1968. And we raised a um, grandchild named Bianca. And she was born June 3rd, 1989. Um, all of them are here except the oldest boy, who is in Atlanta. And um, his occupation is an electrical engineer. Oh, wow. Um, I guess I want to talk a little bit about you growing up in Denham Springs with your family. Were there any particular family traditions or anything like that that you can remember? Um, we always um, celebrated together Thanksgiving and, and, and Christmas. And then there were certain um, um, dishes that were real popular um, that my mother always prepared. Um, one was what is called a uh, deep dish. Um, it's a it's a um, deep, dig deep. It's a salad. Um, that was also <clears throat> something called pig in a blanket. That was real uh, popular with us. We always had it. And that pig in a blanket was taking um, uh, steak, cutting it into strips and taking bacon and cutting it into three pieces per slice, putting it in the bake, in the uh, steak and wrapping it and taking a toothpick and putting it in there to hold it together. And then she would uh, cook it. That was, that was always something we, we look forward to. That was another dish called uh, Ambrose. And Ambrose was, uh, and I have, I have recipes I may have to type them for you to give them to you for each one of these things, and so you know you can have it. But the, the Ambrose was like um, coconut, pineapple, and oranges, and um, the coconut was put on top white, and then that would put cherries that were pitted and put on top. It was a beautiful dish, and I always enjoyed eating it. We also had what is called crackling cornbread, and. Uh, that, that you, you don't see now, but we, we, we had it. Uh, there was something called monkey bread, and I have a recipe for it as well. Um, these are the kind of things that we kind of look forward to. And I mentioned pig in a blanket, didn't mm -hmm. I? Okay. And that was your whole, your extended family would all come together at those holidays? It's, we would always come together for, for the holidays. And if we didn't do it for, uh, most of the time it was Christmas, but now, uh, we have already done it for Thanksgiving, and I, I doubt if we can get them together for Christmas because they are most of them are out of state. Well, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to share in particular? I think we have covered everything. Um, I mentioned the, the the meddling of students mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of the young whites at the time. Um, I, uh, I didn't mention, though, that though, um, segregation was really tough, um, back when I was growing up, um, and it was something that was pretty much accepted. I, I, I may have mentioned that, um, if I was walking on the streets, I think I mentioned it at, at the uh, veterans, that, um, and if I was on Range Avenue and I was sidewalks on each side and the street in the middle, if if whites were taking up the sidewalk, then I would get out and walk in the street until the whites passed, and then I would get back on the uh, the, the sidewalk. But um, through all of this, I remember Catholic nuns would pass and they would wave and they would smile and they were very very friendly and it was almost like seeing an angel here on earth. <laughs> Good to hear. Um, well so you know we're doing this as part of this oral history project for okay. Denham Springs. 
I'm wondering if there's anything in particular you want to pass along about the way you've seen Denham Springs change um, in the community. There's as much difference as daylight and dark between when I was growing up and the way it is now. It's so much so until younger people probably would not believe some of the things that, that, that I see it happen in the past. But um, it's completely a new day, and uh, I um, love Denham Springs, and there's nowhere else, you know, although I have been almost all over the world, there's no other place I want to live other than here. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for your time. This You're is welcome. the end of the interview on Wednesday, December 18th, okay. 2013, with Arthur Perkins.